Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India friends uh, welcome back for another discussion and uh, in continuation to the understanding of the rural society uh, we are going to deal with uh, section 4th of uh, this particular curriculum and uh, the fourth uh, section basically deals with the changing agrarian structure and the rural development concern in rural society and within that uh, we are going to take up uh, unit 14th that is on changing agrarian structure which includes the rural family, rural religion, caste system and the agrarian classes. It will discuss the nature and types of rural family, rural religion, caste system and agrarian classes and changes in these institutions. So friends, I think uh, uh, since uh, these are the four bigger entities uh, when we try to understand uh, the rural society, so we are going to discuss them uh, systematically. Uh, we will start with family and then we will followed by the rural religion and then we are going to talk about the caste system and finally we are going to discuss about uh, the class structure. So I think uh, this is the broader framework in which we are going to take up uh, the discussion. Uh, to begin with let us start with uh, uh, the first uh, part that is the family. So basically we try to see that uh, various scholars have contributed towards the understanding of the uh, uh, rural family and sometimes we try to say that Indian family which has been understood has been seen as a replica in the rural family. So that way I think uh, rural family has its uh, prominence with regard to understanding of uh, the Indian social structure. Professor W. H. R. Rivers has distinguished four types of institution uh, which has been designated by the term family. Uh, he tries to speak about the clan, the matrilocal joint family the patrilocal joint family and the individual family which are all comp <coughs> composed of only parents and the minor family uh, basically when we try to speak about the individual family in terms of nuclear family. And uh, we try to see that uh, uh, these uh, four stage, uh, four types are basically the four main stages of the uh, evolution of the family form corresponding to the four stages in the evolution of the society. Uh, the first type. Uh, correspond to the hunting and the food gathering stage of the social evolution. The second phase, uh, the second is the phase of hawk agriculture and the beginning of domestication of animals and the third is the classical type that is the uh, patriarchal family uh, which reflects to the agricultural economy based on plow and domestication of animal. And finally, uh, the individual family which we are speaking about is a type uh, which is the replica of the modern industrial capitalistic phase of human existence. And we try to see that uh, these are basically seen in terms of uh, the evolution of the society in particular. But uh, what is uh, the rural family? I think uh, that is going to be an important issue. And the Indian rural society provides us a great laboratory to test this view. Uh, it includes the various aspect of clan, uh, matrilocal and patrilocal family types and also it has the uh, uh, beginning of the individual family group also. So we have to see that how our rural society is going to represent the rural family. Now the first thing that we have to keep in mind when we try to speak about uh, the uh, rural family that is familism. Familism is a basis of the rural society and according to this view. Uh, basically prominent eminent uh, sociologists such as Sorokin, Zimmerman and many others have seen that the social and the political organization of all agrarian society during the subsistence stage bears the fundamental trait of the rural family and that way uh, the trait uh, they characterize it as familism. And what is this familism? Since the family has the basic social institution of the rural social world, it is natural to expect that the whole social organization of agricultural aggregates has been stamped by the characteristics of the rural family. 
In other words, all other institutions uh, and fundamental social relationships has been permeated and modeled according to the pattern of the rural family relationship. And familism is the term that used to designate this type of social organization. And families is the outstanding fundamental traits uh, which is seen in terms of gestalt of such a society. The soci uh, sociologist has enumerated the importance and the characteristics of such societies uh, which has the bearing of families and they are as under. The first thing is that marriage earlier and its higher rate. So, the marriage the members of these rural societies marry at the earlier age and then those of the urban societies. Uh, further, the rate of marriage in the former is higher than the later. Second important aspect is that family as a unit of social responsibility. Since family is the unit of rural society, uh, it is the family's collective uh, that pays the taxes and discharge the social responsibilities in the rural society. And that way if you try to see, the individual is also appraised according to the status of the family to which he or she belongs and that is the typical characteristics of the familyism. Uh, third important aspect is that family which is seen as the basis of norms of society. So, we try to see that uh, the ethical codes, religious doctrine, social conception and the legal norms governing the rural society has always been condemned anything uh, which would weaken the stability of the family. So, they have preached the implicit obedience to the parents on the parts of son and daughter and to husband on the part of wife. The fourth aspect is that family which impress in the political form. So, the political organization of uh, the rural society has also been based on the conception on which the rural family rest. Their political ideology has conceived the relation between the ruler and the ruled as that between the head of the family and the members that is it is paternalistic in nature. And the fifth aspect is the cooperative uh, character rather than the contractual relations. The relations between the members of the family in the rural societies are basically cooperative in contrast to those between the members of the urban society uh, which appears to be contractual. This difference according to the view of outstanding sociologists is the result of difference between the rural and the urban family. The sixth aspect uh, which we have to keep in mind with regard to families is that family is the unit of production, consumption and exchange. So, the economic structure of the rural society also bears the trait of the rural family. It is based on the family ownership, the production and consumption of the familistic aspect, the market is less developed and the exchange has more the characteristics of simple barter than the full fledged monetary transaction. And seventh aspect which we have to keep in mind is the dominance of family cult and the ancestor worship. The ideology and the culture of the rural society also exhibit the trait of familyism. The cult of family uh, is important, religion and the ceremonial activities are basically seen uh, in terms of security and the property of the family. Ancestor worship, worship is almost universally prevalent and uh, even the relationship between the god and goddesses are familistic in nature. So, we try to see that uh, this is another significant aspect of families and ultimately we try to see that it involves the dominance of traditions. So, as a result of all these factors uh, in the rural society, we try to see that uh, the traditions severely governs the life processes, the extreme slowness and that makes the uh, rural social structure to be more intact. Now, let us try to understand that what are the characteristics of the patriarchal joint family. So, we try to see that uh, uh, when we speak about the patriarchal joint family, we try to find out that pe it predominates in the rural areas and uh, various sociologists have uh, tried to analyze the uh, rural family and they have observed it on the basis of the structural, psychosocial and the functional features of uh, the types of the rural family and which distinguishes it from the urban family. Now, what are the various important aspects uh, which we have to keep in mind as the characteristics of the rural family? Let us try to see uh, each one of them. The first thing is the greater homogeneity. The rural family is far more homogeneous, stable, integrated and organically functioning than the urban family. The ties 
binding the members of the for, uh, family for instance the husband and the wife parents and the children are stronger and last longer than those of uh, the urban family so we try to see that indian village still remains as a cluster of joint family though due to the number of historical economic causes the joint family has been gradually disintegrating but many aspects are still prevalent in the uh, joint family system uh, second important characteristic is it is based on the peasant household uh, we can see that uh, uh, the essential characteristics of the rural family is that it is generally based on the peasant household all its members are engaged in agricultural occupation work is disturbed uh, distributed among them mainly on the basis of uh, the sex age and other criteria the community house common land and common economic functions along with the common kinship bond creates the peasant household and i think uh, if you can remember shannon's understanding of a peasant family farm i think it is a replica of that now another important aspect uh, uh, in terms of characteristics is that greater discipline and interdependence the rural family is characterized by the greater discipline among its member than the urban family we try to see that uh, uh, for the, there is a provision for meeting educational and the cultural and the social needs of the people in the rural areas and that way they try to satisfy the needs of the members so it act as a center for school as a recreation center as well as the maternity and non maternity hospital uh, for the family members and we try to see another important aspect of uh, the rural family is the dominance of the family ego the interdependence of the members of the rural family and the dependent of its individual members uh, on it are far greater than the case of the urban family and uh, this is basically seen in terms of uh, the emotions of solidarity and cooperation among them and it fulfills the family pride they develop more a collectivistic family con consciousness and less individual individualistic uh, emotions so that way we try to see this is another significant aspect of uh, the rural family uh, another characteristic is the authority of the father uh, since the rural family is more integrated and disciplined unit than the urban family so the head of the rural family exercise absolute power over its over its member it is he who distributes the work of the present household among the family members on the lines of sex and age differences he arranges the marriages for son daughters and other members he administers the joint family property according to his wisdom and he trains the youngsters for the future agricultural work and social life so that way i think uh, uh, as a headman of the family uh, his role is contributed uh, con considered to be very significant and then i think uh, we try to see that there is a closer participation in various activities that is another important characteristic that we try to see and uh, this is basically in terms of uh, the engagement uh, with the various work uh, which is connected to the present household and they spend practically uh, the whole day together uh, in working uh, for each other and that is how the uh, emotional bonding and the solidarity of the family is maintained but friends uh, this particular characteristics which we try to see in terms of rural family uh, i think uh, a change that is the law of nature so we try to see that uh, even the changes are there in the rural family also so let us try to see what are the changing uh, aspect of the rural family and what are the trends which are coming up so we try to see that uh, until the impact of industrial revolution and the competitive market economy a uh, feminism was the heart of the village communities and the subsistence agrarian economics and the rural society were based on the familistic uh, aspect uh, however the rise and development of the modern industries have steadily undermined the subsistence agrarian economy and brought the rural economy within the orbit of capitalistic market economy so in india we try to see that uh, due to the lack of sufficient industrial development the force of urban society has not penetrated deep into the rural society uh, which we try to see in other countries like united states of america great britain and other european countries so the rural family consequently retains uh, its specific traits uh, to a far extent uh, which is reflected in the indian uh, rural society and we try to see that the members of the rural family develops a desire uh, to uh, the modern occupation as the urban industrial development is taking place 
there is a demand uh, that they are share in the joint family property and also the migration to the towns and the cities are uh, have started happening. So, this process undermines the joint family based on the common occupation of its member and the joint, proper, uh, joint property and income and expenditures are going to be on the sharing basis. So, we try to see that uh, there are certain amount of uh, distortions which are happening uh, with regard to the uh, rural family. We also try to see that the capitalistic economic development uh, has also transformed the social and the political environment of the people especially we try to see that the private and the state agencies has increasingly established schools, dispensaries and administrative and judicial machineries in the village. The rural family which serve as a school for its members are no longer functional as such since its member now begin to receive the education outside the family also the not the grandfather or grandmother the embodiment of traditional medical knowledge uh, but now the doctors are appointed by an agency uh, and they try to look after the health uh, services. Similarly, the caste and the panchayat councils were deprived of their function as guardian of law and dispenser of the justice and the customary law has been replaced by the new constitutional measures uh, in terms of administration and the judicial organs. So, we try to see that uh, rural societies has been increasingly urbanized in the modern times and they are basically trying to see certain amount of changes uh, in terms of uh, uh, the family structure. Uh, there is a, a decline in terms of uh, uh, the joint family system uh, which we try to see in terms of familyism and the individual hitherto has submerged uh, in and subordinated to the family tends to become atomistic. He more and more breaks away from the family restrictions, he develops his own initiative and independence and this inevitably results in weakening of the family authority family ties and the family itself. So, we try to see that uh, these are certain things uh, which are basically happening with regard to uh, the typical family system <coughs> even now the early child uh, marriage uh, that is also been restricted to a greater extent. We also try to see that the number of case of divorce has also started increasing. So, virtually we try to see that uh, the joint family which was composed of the member belonging to number of generations has been now uh, uh, have become a tiny units and composed of husband, wife and the unmarried children uh, which is the typicality of the nuclear family in the urban setting. And the phenomenon of familyism in terms of collectivity too has gradually start dropping down. So, now we try to see is gradually starting uh, the new gestalt uh, in terms of uh, bringing the new form of uh, uh, family system. So, the family the rural family which was seen as an essence of uh, the rural society has gradually started changing uh, into the new forms. So, friends I think uh, after speaking about uh, the issue of family uh, quickly let us try to speak about the rural religion and its significance with regard to the rural society. I think uh, religion definitely plays a very crucial role when we try to see the uh, agrarian social structure and within that framework uh, the role of religion is going to be very prime. Now, what are the principal reasons which we try to see are to be observed when we try to speak about uh, the rural religion and I think uh, we try to see that the study of rural religion and its significant role in determining the life processes of the rural society, society uh, forms the essential part of the study of the rural society. It has been observed by sociologists all over the world that the rural people have the great predisposition to religion uh, than with the urban people and the uh, dependence of agriculture in terms of the form of production in the countryside has uh, made them closer to the nature uh, because of their dependency on rain and uh, they are lacking the scientific culture and which provides them uh, closer to the natural world. Uh, the traditional religion uh, which is composed of the crudest conception of the world whole in their minds uh, in the form of animism, magic, uh, polytheism, uh, ghost beliefs and other forms of primitive religions are part and parcel of the uh, rural population and they try to practice that. Uh, apart from that, uh, the religious outlook of the rural people uh, dominates their intellectual, emotional and the practical life. It is difficult to locate any aspect of life. Uh, which is not permeated with the uh, color of the religion. Their family life, their caste life, their general social life, economic and even the recreational life 
uh, uh, we try to see that uh, the so called religious approach is going to be an important issue. The religious conception also largely dominates their ethical standards, the form of content uh, with regard to the art, painting, sculpture, architectures, uh, folk songs. So, in many aspects, uh, the religion is going to dominate and this is what uh, makes it unique and different from uh, the other forms of religion. Uh, and also we try to see that in societies based on the substance economy, the leadership of the village life is uh, in all domain was been provided by the priestly group and in India like we have the Brahmins. So, the mores uh, which this group laid down for the individual behaviors uh, as well as for the social control were determined by the traditional religious concepts and hence the village aggregate in all spheres was molded in the spirit of religious ideas and dogmas and was controlled by the religious institutions and leaders. And also we try to see that uh, with the new developmental aspect taking place in the modern times in India, uh, we try to find out that gradually uh, certain uh, new and secular centralized states has come into the picture and they are basically trying to put the religious conceptions into a different framework and now they had moved gradually from sacred to the secular. But more or less we try to see that still uh, the religion uh, has an upper hand when we try to speak about the rural religion. Although secularization is going to be uh, there, but again I think that the domination of uh, uh, the primary aspect of uh, or the crude form of religious. Uh, comprising of uh, animism, magic and the other aspects are going to be still practiced and we try to see that uh, the rural religion is basically seen as uh, an important aspect in terms of uh, uh, what you can say creating the homogeneity uh, within the rural society and that way I think uh, uh, the religion uh, which is the marker of the rural society is going to be very important. Now, let us try to see what are the uh, three important aspect of the rural religion and which makes it, ma makes it distinct from uh, the other. The first thing of course is we try to see rural religion as providing a specific world outlook. Now, what we mean by that uh, the world outlook provides by the rural religion includes the ingredients such as magical conception, enemies, uh, the conception of uh, the bizarre world people by spirits, the conception of post humus world of dead ancestors who have to be worshipped and also the issue of mythology is going to be important. The most striking feature of the rural religion is its dynamic concept conception of the universe. The conception of the universe uh, which is seen as a theater of the interplay of conscious freely acting elements. The rural religion unfolds uh, such word like uh, Pitralok, Pretlok, Devlok and Vakunthdham. Uh, so, basically it speaks about uh, the different aspects that is the world of dead ancestors, the disembodied spirits, god and goddesses and also the celestial world. So, we try to see that uh, apart from this uh, the deities are in the form of uh, the fertility, various epidemic, uh, epidemics, uh, rivers and forests. In fact, the rural religion sees the spirit practically behind all the phenomenon and creates a uh, uh, canvas of the new numerous activities with regard to the world of spirits. So, we try to see that uh, the crude form of rural religion is quite prevalent when we try to speak about uh, the rural society in terms of the world outlook. Another important aspect of the rural religion is in terms of a body of practices. Now, the body of religious practices prescribed by the rural religion is bit imposing and these practices may be divided into uh, three groups. First of course is the prayers, uh, prayers basically it means to say that the individual is enjoined to offer the prayers to various deities at home as well as outside the home. At home he is required to pray uh, to the family, god and goddesses, the prayer are offered by members of the family uh, uh, to others also and further we try to see that every street or locality in the village has its own duty, a deity. There is also a village temple in which the village god uh, that is Gram Devta is installed and community prayers have been offered over there. So, virtually we try to see that uh, plenty of deities are associated uh, with regard to the uh, rural society and also we try to see 
that another important aspect apart from prayer is the sacrifices. The rural religion prescribes a variety of sacrificial acts uh, to its adherents uh, which range from sprinkling of some drops of water and scattering of leaves or grains in front of deities to offer the animals and uh, even sometimes the human sacrifices also. So, the rural religion is composed of various sub religions and even the sub religions prescribe its followers a particular set of sacrificial acts. Uh, sacrifices are offered to a variety of god and goddesses. Uh, there are food god that is Anudevta, the god of different disease uh, which are seen, uh, the rain god, the rain goddess and also many other god and goddesses are there uh, which are prevalent in the rural societies and sacrifices are offered to appropriate uh, them and to uh, thereby disarm their wrath or wire uh, their favor and in order to have uh, the positive blessings from them these sacrifices are done. So, we try to see that a sociological analysis of sacrifice is valuable for comprehending the conception of the rural people of the cause of disease, flood and even devastating phenomenon. And mythology in fact is the history of society in terms of uh, symbolism and since society changes the pantheon of god and goddesses also changes. So, we try to see that rural society has at present becomes the amphitheater of the struggle between the conservative and the reformist religious tendencies and the movement and that way the culture of the rural people is predominantly religious and sacrifices also forms the theme of the rural folklore. The third aspect uh, which is essential uh, with regard to the rural religion is the rituals. One of the significant feature of the life of the rural people is uh, the meticulous domination even in details about the rituals. The conception of purity has been elaborated in the past Indian society to such an extent that it became a verifiable principle. Rituals are the religion, uh, religious means by which the purity of the individual and the social life becomes guaranteed. The inherited rural religion uh, prescribes a complex patterns of behavior for the individual as well as for the various social groups in all the spheres of life. Complex because uh, the rituals are associated with their numerous significant and even insignificant activities. The rituals are associated with most of the life activities of the rural people. A ritual is prescribed whenever the individual or the social group initiates an activity even though the activity may be like food taking repeated in the future or sometimes it is going to be uh, going outside. So, all these activities involve certain amount of rituals and uh, every ritual has its own relevance with regard to the rural society. And we try to see that before an individual uh, Brahmin start consuming the food uh, uh, as a uh, important uh, ritual, he is required to draw a magical circle round the dish and has to offer certain grains. Uh, these are the rituals prescribed for number of uh, ordinary mundane and the secular activities. Uh, there are the bath rituals uh, uh, which are associated, there are occupational rituals, uh, the rituals should be performed when a per person occupies a residential pre premises. So, all these things are the landmarks in terms of uh, uh, agricultural production or maybe many other aspects of uh, uh, activities involves certain amount of specific rituals. Uh, which are to be performed by the ritual specialist. So, in fact, we uh, remark that it is very difficult to locate in the Hindu society where the uh, religious observance ends and the secular practice begins and especially when we try to speak about the uh, rural society, uh, it becomes more uh, crucial. Another important aspect that we have to keep in mind in terms of uh, rural religion is that it is an institutional complex. The Hindu religion which is preponderant section of rural population subscribes to uh, uh, numerous sub religion and the religious cult. A number of these sub religions and religious cult have to be institutionalized. Corresponding to these institutionalized practices, we try to find out that uh, there are number of religious organizations uh, which are basically working uh, in the larger interest of the community. Uh, some of the religious organization functions uh, at the national scale also like we try to see that uh, the various muts, ashrams and temples uh, where the adherent flock 
or to uh, comes to worship and to pray the various deities and also listen to the religious discourses. So, we try to see that uh, uh, religion is seen as an institution as a complex institution which, in, uh, which involves a uh, lot many entities uh, which are submerged together and they form the whole complex. There are various kinds of priests, uh, there are the family priest who serves the religious needs of the family, the caste and the sub caste have their own priest who cater to the needs of the various caste and also we have the village priest who look after the village temple and meets the religious requirement of the village community as a whole. And uh, beyond that uh, if you try to see, we try to find out that uh, uh, we had number of other rituals uh, which are been practiced by the uh, priest in their own way. Uh, and sometimes we try to see that apart from priest, there are large number of roving religious men which are commonly called as the sannyasis uh, who mostly tour in the rural areas and some of them are preachers of the religious cult uh, to which they belong. And uh, these holy men uh, who comes to village uh, for a frequent visits and they try to find that uh, the hospitality of the uh, villages are going to be uh, very significant uh, uh, for their tour. So, that way we try to see that uh, it is always a source of attraction for the sannyasis in terms of their visits and that way I think uh, the rural uh, setting appears to be uh, the appropriate place for continuation of the rural religion and that makes the uh, whole cosmology of the rural society to be complex and also uh, continued in terms of maintain, maintaining the stronger agrarian social system. So, I think uh, this is what we have uh, spoken about with regard to the, uh, the important aspect that is the rural religion. Now, I think uh, quickly we will try to see another important thing uh, which act as an important parameter for understanding the agrarian social structure. We are basically referring to the caste system and uh, caste system I think uh, uh, we cannot escape caste system if we have to understand the rural society and that is how we try to see the importance of caste with regard to the rural society. And as a student of the Indian society, uh, we try to always see that uh, uh, caste definitely plays a very crucial role when we try to speak about uh, uh, the rural India. In India, the caste is determining, uh, uh, largely determines the functions, the status, the available opportunities and also uh, it provides certain kind of discriminations and that way we try to see that caste is going to have the numerous effect uh, in terms of uh, uh, perpetuation of uh, uh, different uh, stratification in the society. And we try to see that uh, it is not only seen as a status symbol, but it is also seen as a marker of one's identity in the rural society. Uh, let us try to see that what are the specificities of caste in the rural society. Uh, uh, definitely it has a functional role in maintaining the uh, village social system and some of the special functions performed by the caste in the villages are uh, first thing is uh, in terms of the phases of life. So, the individual life style passes through birth, uh, bethrol, marriage and death and on all these occasions there is a definite role of caste. Whatever may be the secular status of Brahmin, his presence is obligatory to officiate at the fulfillment of rituals on the major phases of the life. Second important aspect is the principle of exogamy and endogamy. One cannot marry uh, with his sister nor can marry with any of his agnates. So, marriage within the gotra or clan is prohibited. So, this rule of exogamy of is observed strictly in the village society. However, we try to see that uh, sometimes in the urban settings we try to overlook this phenomenon. But we try to see that uh, village exogamy is quite prominent when we try to speak about the rural society and uh, that is what it makes uh, different from the urban setting. Then another important aspect is the occupational interdependence. The caste society is essentially based on the elaborate division of labor and actually the village economy uh, a few years back dependent upon the typical Jajmani system. E system has its own occupational specialization like we have the Darji, the Nai, the Dhobi, Kumhar and Chamar uh, which are having the specific which are seen as an uh, specific uh, occupational caste and these castes gave their services to their judgment or the client on exchange basis. And this is something which is considered to be 
hereditary which passes from generation to generation and another important aspect is that uh, here the exchanges are to be paid in kind and not in cash. Also we try to see that caste association is an important aspect of the rural society. We try to see that uh, 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 we have number of instances where the caste associations are going to be quite strong and I think uh, uh, sometimes we try to see many caste conflicts are based on uh, the various caste associations uh, which is with regard to the different caste groups and that is what uh, makes the things more complex. Uh, similarly, we try to see that caste is the mirror of the rural society. Uh, we try to see uh, in terms of the fact that uh, uh, it is basically seen as that uh, the caste which has its upholding uh, especially in terms of power and also in terms of identification of a uh, village, we try to see that this village is Rajput village or this is a Brahmin village or this is basically uh, oriented towards a specific caste and that is how the village are been recognized. So, caste definitely is seen as the mirror of the villages and also we try to see another important aspect which is associated with the, the caste that is the dominant caste uh, which has been uh, discussed earlier in the unit first. I think uh, we try to discuss about the contribution of M. N. Srinivas in terms of dominant caste. So, quickly I can say that the concept of dominant caste is very clearly uh, visible in terms of making the major decisions to maintain the uh, uh, law and order in the village system. And another important aspect that we have to keep in mind is the hierarchical relations and we try to see that social interaction in the villages are being guided by the caste status. Uh, caste in fact is a system of hierarchical relations and it is to be seen in terms of the pyramid of a hierarchy where at the top is the Brahmins and gradually we try to see that hierarchy is been maintained uh, in terms of uh, interaction either it is the uh, social interaction or it is the exchange of uh, food or even if you try to see uh, during the ceremony also uh, the sort of hierarchy is been maintained. Another important aspect which we have to see with regard to the caste and rural is that caste has a bearing on the economic life. Basically by that we mean to say that uh, uh, the traditional occupations of the caste are been predetermined uh, rather I will say uh, that is based on birth and that way we try to see that caste every caste has its own occupation in terms of uh, the economic life and uh, it is sometimes difficult to change uh, one's own occupation uh, if it is a typical uh, rural setting. However, I think another important aspect that we have to keep in mind is the notion of the mobility and we try to see that economic mobility of a person uh, is also determined by the caste. Uh, in a sense as I just shared earlier that the traditional occupations are difficult to change uh, until and unless the people is moving out or he has been boycotted. Uh, but in all senses we try to see that the rural society uh, the occupational mobility and social mobility has to be analyzed in terms of uh, uh, what is the nature of caste and how much flexibility is given by the members of the caste in order to bring about the change. And also we try to see that the caste has to be seen in terms of uh, uh, the joint family. I think uh, we try to see that there is a strong correlation which is there between the caste and the joint family. And actually it is the caste structure which determines the nature of family whether it is joint or nuclear in the village. It is observed that uh, uh, the, the, the caste in the rural society is essentially a cluster of joint families and which basically are seen in terms of a specific tola or a specific mohalla. Uh, which are in the name of a joint family of the various caste groups. So, that is how we try to see the clustering of the uh, village setting in terms of uh, various localities and that way I think caste is going to play a very crucial role. But still I think uh, uh, when we try to speak about certain amount of rigidity uh, which is happening because of the caste structure, we also try to see that uh, there are certain amount of changes which are happening with regard to the rural caste stratification and that way we try to see that uh, the changes which are visible are seen at two levels. Uh, one of course is uh, uh, we try to see at the structural changes and sometimes another aspect which we try to see is in terms of peripheral changes. So, the structural changes has a far reaching impact on the rural caste system especially uh, with the advent of uh, uh, what you can say various uh, reforms which has been introduced by government of India and also by various agencies we try to see that uh, the changes are quite visible. 
like the evolution of uh, the zamindari and the jagirdari system, introduction of the panchayati raj, adult franchise, cooperatives and many such initiatives, all these things have resulted into the changes and uh, we try to see that these changes had brought certain amount of structural change. Similarly, we try to see peripheral changes uh, which are with regard to the establishment of the modern schools, construction of roads, uh, public health centers, communication links and the uh, different aspect of migrations and which are basically bringing about certain amount of changes. But broadly if we have to see that what are the changes uh, which we can see with regard to the caste system, uh, at least we can see uh, the issue, the first component that we can see is the issue of modernization and sensitization. I think uh, this is one important aspect uh, uh, which is uh, quite uh, evident because modernization definitely is going to include uh, many aspects uh, in the form of a modern education, uh, uh, state politics, uh, the new power relations, the style of life and also certain amount of consumerism with regard to the technology. So, I think uh, these are the reasons for having certain amount of changes in the caste system and also parallelly we try to see uh, the phenomenon of sensitization uh, which also we have discussed in unit 1 uh, that how M. N. Srinivas was trying to speak about the social change uh, in the caste in terms of sensitization whereby the people of the uh, lower strata uh, they try to imitate the behavior of uh, the upper caste that is the twice born. So, I think uh, these are the possible uh, ways in which the changes are visible. Another important aspect is the issue of desensitization and uh, desensitization which has been uh, talked about uh, in terms of uh, the fa fa fact that uh, uh, many of the changes are visible in terms of living their own uh, uh, specific culture and we try to see that uh, we have certain amount of downfall in the status of the caste uh, because of the shift in the occupation like K. L. Sharma who had uh, intimate experiences of working in the villages of Rajasthan, uh, he tried to see that how the higher caste are giving, giving up their Sanskritic values and they are coming in, in uh, interaction with the lower caste. Uh, so, we try to see that uh, certain amount of uh, things are changing and uh, either it is the question of uh, eating together, uh, sharing the same hookah or sometimes there are rare cases of uh, intermarriages. Uh, so, this kind of changes are characterized by uh, K. L. Sharma as desensitization. Similarly, we try to see another important aspect that is the value of achievement. I think uh, this is where we try to see that uh, the changes are quite visible. Uh, we try to see that uh, commensality has become a common uh, thing and within that we try to see that uh, the value of achievement orientation is going to give uh, to be given importance and especially when we try to see uh, in the name of democracy, socialism and secularism, we try to see that the rituals and uh, the sort of uh, restrictions uh, which has been there regard with regard to the caste that also has gradually changed. So, I think uh, that is another important aspect uh, in terms of change in the caste system. Similarly, we have the uh, sort of proletarianism uh, that is seen as a structural change in terms of higher caste of the rural society. Uh, we try to see that uh, higher caste find their status withdrawal, uh, especially we, when we try to see that the evolution of uh, zamindari system uh, or the zagidari systems have been there. We try to find out that the zamindars of Uttar Pradesh and Bihar and the zagidars of Rajasthan and the darbars of Gujarat have obliged to take a manual labor and the lower jobs and such a uh, kind of process has reduced the status of higher caste to that of the proletariats. So, we try to find out that uh, these sort of phenomena are also happening with regard to uh, the shift in the uh, status of uh, uh, the so called caste and also we try to see there is a shift in the source of power and uh, by that basically we mean to say like uh, we try to say that uh, the dominant caste uh, uh, which is normally the upper caste is going to have a bigger say in the uh, village in terms of uh, uh, having a certain amount of uh, 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 power structure, but we try to see that now uh, many things have started emerging especially uh, with the origin and position of the uh, Gram Panchayat uh, or even the parliamentary uh, uh, affairs uh, has been uh, come into the village structure. We try to see that uh, now uh, the question of prestige and power uh, they have gradually shifted uh, as per uh, 
uh, what you can say the <coughs> changing norms and sometimes it is associated with the different caste uh, even with the uh, scheduled caste, scheduled tribes and other backward classes and they are going to play a crucial role in terms of the crucial decision making. So, I think uh, this is uh, quickly what we have to understand uh, the caste system uh, in terms of uh, its uh, intricacies and definitely as we have seen that uh, caste uh, which has been uh, seen as an important pillar uh, for understanding the rural society or to, uh, to be frank to understand the Indian society in particular and definitely uh, it has a strong bearing on the agrarian social structure. But uh, I think uh, through time uh, there is certain amount of flexibility which has started happening uh, in the rural society and that way if you try to see uh, we try to find out that uh, the things are gradually changing and it is giving a new color uh, in terms of the change of the caste system. Uh, definitely we can say that uh, the phenomenon of caste has weakened through time, but uh, that does not mean that uh, caste system has totally been eroded or uh, exhausted from the uh, rural society. I think that may not be correct to say at this juncture. So, definitely caste system has uh, shown uh, a shift, but that shift is not an end of the caste system. So, I think uh, this is what uh, I have to say with regard to the uh, caste system uh, which is seen as part and parcel of uh, the agrarian social structure. And finally, we will come down to uh, last uh, uh, aspect of uh, this particular uh, chapter that is the agrarian class structure. And uh, the agrarian class structure uh, is again going to be crucial because uh, that is another form of stratification which we try to see. Uh, with regard to the rural society. Uh, now, let us first try to see that what are the agrarian class structure in the British period and then how gradually it has changed through time uh, in the independent period. So, quickly if you try to see that the main uh, aspect of the British period were uh, to be seen in terms of uh, having uh, the various land tenure, we try to see that the British introduced the three major types of land tenures in the rural India. Uh, the Zamindari, the Royatwari and the Mahalwari. Uh, the Zamindari was on the basis of Permanent Settlement Act 1793 and the Zamindari system was introduced in Bengal and later on it was extended to Uttar Pradesh, Bihar and the major part of Odisha and even some parts of Madras. And under this system, Zamindaris were given the freedom to collect whatever the possible rent they wanted to take on behalf of the state or the uh, ruler. So, virtually we try to see that Zamindari system was a prom prominent system uh, which has been there uh, during the British period. Also, we have the Royatwari system uh, which was basically seen as uh, uh, being uh, a case in which uh, the settlement uh, was made whereby the peasant who was been recognized as a proprietor with the right to sublet or mortgage or transfer the land. And this system was initiated uh, in Madras and later on it was extended to Bombay, uh, Madhya Pradesh and some parts of Assam. Uh, it is to be noted that around 90 percent, 95 percent of the cultivable lands was under the zamindars and the royatwari system in that period. Similarly, we have another aspect that is the Mahalwari system, uh, which is also seen as an important uh, 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 revenue system. We try to see that uh, it has been introduced in some part of United Province and also uh, to some parts of Punjab. And we try to see that uh, uh, this system was also very prominent in terms of uh, uh, having certain amount of uh, control uh, over the land and it was also seen as uh, a cultivator under the system could neither acquire any ownership right uh, on the land nor could he transfer it. So, that way I think uh, these are significant uh, uh, land revenue systems which were prevalent and which has led to the specific uh, agrarian class structure in the rural society. And also we try to see that uh, agrarian classes and uh, uh, what was the class relations which has been there. Uh, so, quickly if we try to see uh, with regard to the British period in India, uh, first category definitely uh, because of uh, these various uh, land revenue systems, uh, the first category was the landlords. They were the owners of the vast plot of land. Uh, however, there were various categories of landowners within this class. It may be the intermediary landowners also uh, like zamindars, talukdars, pattadars, absentee landlords and also the rich farmers. But the common ground uh, of their economic interest was that they were employed mostly either uh, they mostly employed 
the tenants, sharecroppers, or the agricultural laborers for the purpose of cultivation of their land. And uh, definitely, they were non-cultivating renter classes. The second category, uh, which is going to be crucial, is the tenants. They were basically holding the uh, lease under the landlords for the various categories. Many of the tenants also employed under tenants or the purpose for the purpose of cultivation of the part of their land. Similarly, we have another category that is the peasant proprietors uh, who were basically seen as the actual cultivators of the small plot of land uh, with or without the occupancy rights. Uh, they were mostly the substance cultivators and were dependent on family labor for the cultivation of their soil. So, we try to see that uh, this was another category of uh, class uh, which was represented in the uh, British period and also we have the agricultural working class. Uh, agricultural working class was basically including uh, the agricultural laborers and the sharecroppers uh, who belong to this category and uh, basically they were working uh, on the land of others uh, uh, maybe around the year or on the seasonal basis uh, to have their livelihood. So, I think uh, these are the broader uh, agrarian class structure where, which were prevalent uh, during the British period. Now, let us try to see uh, how we can understand the various agrarian class structure in the post independence period. And I think uh, the attainment of independence uh, called for the far reaching structural reforms in the agrarian system and certain basic changes have been evolved. Like we try to see the comprehensive land reforms and the various rural development programs uh, which has been initiated uh, by the national and the state government uh, towards this goal uh, of uh, uh, equality since independence. Now, let us try to see uh, the contribution of various sociologists uh, uh, who try to see uh, the understanding of uh, agrarian class in their own way. Uh, the first in this category can be Daniel Thorner uh, and his popular uh, classification is uh, in terms of three category uh, that is the uh, first is Malik which includes the big landlords and the rich landlords. Then you have the second category that is the Kisan which includes the small landlords and the substantial tenants and the third category is the Mazdur uh, which are basically the sharecroppers, landless laborers and the uh, <coughs> what you can say laborers uh, who are doing uh, allied activities. Uh, so, these are the three categories which has been discussed by Daniel Thorner. Uh, then also we have the contribution by uh, uh, R. K. Mukherjee. R. K. Mukherjee has basically divided uh, the understanding of uh, agrarian class structure of Bengal into class 1, class 2 and class 3. Uh, class 1 which includes the occupational group of landholders and the superior farmers. Class 2 includes the self-sufficient peasantry, cultivators and artisans and class 3 involves the sharecroppers, agricultural uh, laborers and the service holders. So, I think uh, these are the three classifications uh, uh, which has been talked about by R. K. Mukherjee. Then we have G. R. Gardgil uh, who had tried to see uh, classification of uh, agrarian class on the basis of substantial landlords and the trading uh, trade money lenders that is one category and then you have the landless laborers uh, who have been exploited. Uh, then we have P. C. Joshi's uh, understanding about uh, uh, the agrarian class and he has basically basically classified into four categories the big farmers, the small farmers, the marginal farmers and the landless laborers. Then we also have a, a quick uh, understanding of Utsa Patnaik uh, who had tried to see that how uh, we can see uh, the agrarian class in terms of exploitation uh, which she calls as an E factor and the nature of ex exploitation involves the nature of labor. And on the basis of that, uh, uh, she tried to speak about uh, the various categories as uh, the first is the landlord who is basically having no manual labor as self-employed and large employment of others labor is going to be important. Second is the rich peasant, uh, rich peasant uh, which has at least as large as employment of other labor as self-employment. The third is the middle peasant. Uh, which has the smaller employment of other labor than the self-employment. And then you have small peasants who had zero employment of others and working for others to a small extent than for the self-employment. And then we have the poor peasant uh, who was working for others to the greater extent uh, rather than the self-employment. And finally, we have the landless labor uh, which does not have the self-employment 
and working entirely for others. So, I think on the nature of exploitation, Utsa Patnaik has tried to have the green class structure on these lines and virtually we try to see that in a broader framework, uh, we can have uh, the peasantry also in terms of uh, the specific uh, uh, what you can say uh, land size and we can say that uh, uh, peasantry and the magnitude of the land uh, plays a very crucial role. Uh, like we have the poor peasantry who can be classified between 1.60 acres or less, the middle peasantry who can be classified between 1.61 to 9.80 acres, we have the lower middle uh, uh, peasantry who is between 1.60 to 4.60 acres and then we have the uh, upper middle uh, which is between the 4.60 uh, acres to 9.80 acres of land and we have the rich capitalistic landlords who are between 9.81 and above acres of land. So, that is how on the basis of the magnitude of land uh, and the nature of peasantry we can have the classification. Uh, similarly, we have uh, the classification by D. S. Swami uh, and uh, his analysis uh, is based on uh, the differentiation of peasantry and uh, he basically tries to see uh, classification in terms of landlord, poor peasant, small peasant and well to do peasant. So, that is the classification uh, which has been given by D. S. Swami. Uh, then we have uh, the classification by Ashok Rudra who tries to see uh, classes in terms of class of big which includes the class of agricultural laborers. Then we have uh, land uh, landowners, we have agricultural laborers, we have owners in terms of haves and have nots. So, this is how the classification is given on the Marxian lines which is again going to be important. And then we have uh, the contribution of Pranab Bardhan uh, who was trying to speak about uh, uh, the green cla classes in terms of uh, landlords, rich peasants, poor peasants, landless agricultural laborers. And uh, finally, we can speak about the class structure of Andre Bete uh, who had studied the Tanjore village and we try to see that uh, his classification of uh, the green class has been uh, in terms of land owners of land, non owners of land, big absentee landlords, small owner cultivators, tenants and the agricultural laborers. So, I think uh, this is where we can see that uh, these are the different classifications of uh, uh, agrarian class uh, uh, which has been seen uh, after independence. Uh, friends, I think uh, uh, quickly we have tried to cover up uh, the significant components of the agrarian social structure and we basically try to see that how the agrarian class structure can be seen uh, in terms of uh, four important uh, uh, concepts or other four different entities. Uh, the first is the uh, family, the rural family which we try to see and then we try to speak about uh, the rural religion uh, which has its own specificity and then also we try to see uh, caste system which is going to play a very crucial role and ultimately we try to see the understanding in terms of the class structure agrarian class. So, I think uh, these are the four important aspect uh, uh, which we uh, find and which, which we see that uh, they are going to play a very crucial role uh, with regard to the understanding of uh, the agrarian social structure. Uh, but important is that uh, I think uh, we have uh, uh, certain other things also which we can incorporate. Uh, but somewhere we have tried to uh, structure the unit in such a fashion that I can uh, deliberate upon the maximum component uh, so that we can have a uh, uh, what you can say not a crystal understanding about the phenomenon, but we can have a broader picture about how the things are visible. So, that way I think uh, I just try to club up uh, uh, four uh, aspects together uh, which will help us in understanding the agrarian social structure. Definitely I think agrarian social structure is going to be something which is seen as a stable framework and it is, it is going to provide the broader outline in what uh, in which we try to see the rural society. So, that way I think uh, we have seen uh, the different components uh, which are the markers of uh, the agrarian social structure and that way we have to have uh, uh, these readings, but uh, I think uh, plenty of uh, materials are there uh, which we have to still forego and uh, I think uh, uh, most of uh, my discussion is based on air the size contribution. Uh, of uh, uh, the famous work that is rural sociology in India. And apart from that, uh, I think uh, uh, we had uh, many other uh, contributions, especially Guru Swami's contribution on development, development sociology uh, that also one has to read. And apart from that, I think uh, plenty of scholars, K. L. Sharma's rural society in India and also we can have uh, 
uh, the contribution by uh, P. C. Joshi and others, uh, Andre Bete for their sake. So, I think uh, plenty of names are there who have contributed significantly on the uh, agrarian social structure. So, I think uh, we have to read it further uh, for further details uh, so that we can have more exhaustive understanding about the agrarian social structure. So, friends, I think uh, with all these things, uh, uh, I can say that uh, we have to learn a lot and uh, these outlines are going to make you a uh, bit clear about what is the agrarian social structure. So, with these things, uh, I will say thanks to all of you for your patience listening and also I think uh, uh, we will have to learn more uh, when we try to interact further in terms of understanding of the last unit uh, which is going to be quite contemporary and relevant for understanding the rural society. So, thank you to all of you.